target actually Trump on this? I mean, I could see how people would be led to believe and, and really fully believe that it is, especially after everything that they were involved in as it relates to the Russian collusion story. Or really, is this actually more of a hit at Biden and plans to maybe perhaps replace Biden with Harris? And that's that's one of the other that's one of the theories floating around joining us right now. He's written a, a lot on this issue and he's got a, a piece that came out yesterday on it. My friend Andy McCarthy, who is a best selling author, Ball of Collusion, the plot to rig an election and destroy a presidency, a senior fellow at National Review. And you can see him on Fox News as well. Andy, always good to talk with you. Happy Friday, my friend. Who's who, who is the target of, of Pelosi's uh, her operation here? Is is it really Biden or or I mean, it seems on its face it's Trump. But is there a broader is there a broader goal here? Yeah, well, I think the goal is Trump, Dana, and I think it's um, political. But the thing is, um, you know, for all who marvel at the, the speaker as a great strategist, this seems to me like one of the stupidest things I've seen in a long time, <laughs> which is actually saying something. Because why would she do something that gave Trump the opportunity to say that it's directed at Biden and thereby raise Biden's confidence three weeks before the election as an issue when they're trying to beat Trump. I mean, it doesn't make a, I think what happened here is she got a little bit hot under the collar uh, and she wants to, you know, Trump is, Trump has gone crazy about her, um, you know, gallivanting around uh, Chinatown in San Francisco without a mask and in crowds and, you know, encouraging people to come when the coronavirus was breaking out and, uh, and all that stuff. So, you know, she's trying to do a little turnabout here, which is it's politics. It's fair enough. And she wants Trump to say when was his last negative test before he tested positive because they want to have a, a political narrative, maybe supported by some facts that he was irresponsible when he started to feel sick and maybe got other people sick. So, I, you know, that's that's uh, it's not being bad. Right. That's the kind of stuff they do. But I think she did this in furtherance of that narrative. And maybe didn't realize that it would it could actually blow up on her because it's got no chance of being enacted since the vice president has to agree. Mm. It has to be uh, enacted by law, which means both houses would have to pass it and the president would have to sign it, which would never happen. And it can't repeal the Constitution. So it, you couldn't have this committee unilaterally able to say – the president was incapacitated. You need the vice president under the 25th Amendment. And it has to be a real incapacity like what happened with Wilson in 1919 when he had a stroke. Or if it's a temporary thing, like if a president has to go under anesthesia to have some surgery, you know, we've had that happen a couple of times. But none of this, it has no chance of being enacted into law so the only way it makes sense that she raised it was as as kind of a shot at Trump in the politics of the campaign. But I think he actually she actually gave him a weapon rather than hurting him any. Yeah, that's what it seems like. And and also, too, I mean, if it just to, to go down that road, if, it, if she was actually lo- setting Biden up, I mean, then you're 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 really gambling with voters who are seeing this play out in public and they see that the they would see that the House Speaker would be setting up the Democrat nominee with basically a vote of no confidence before the elections even taken place. And that would cause a lot of people to question their votes because, you know, the vice president, nobody, the, everyone always says you don't vote for the vice president. But if that looks like people might be doing it, there are a lot of people who wouldn't support the Democrat ticket because they wouldn't want a Harris presidency. So she would it, w- it really would be. I agree with you. I think it would be undermining. Uh, it would be undermining her own side and her her own power. Now, with this, because the way that people have talked about this, and Andy, you have a great piece that's up at NationalReview.com about this. The Twenty Fifth Amendment. It's is she she's. It seems like she's using this as as a as it just like a substitute for like they couldn't get impeachment. They couldn't take him out through the Russian collusion. Right. So I guess this is next on the list. But it seems like the bar is a lot higher here, and it's not really a substitution for the other two. Yeah, I know this uh, in Trump years, this this seems like a long time, like 25 years ago when Rod <laughs> Rosenstein wanted to right. invoke the 25th Amendment. But, you know, we we had this uh, 
we had this national conversation back then, right? And uh, what a number of scholars uh, and, and people who understood the history of when and why this amendment was enacted, what, what they pointed out was that it's not a proxy for impeachment. If you want to remove the president because you think he's committed misconduct that rises to the level of impeachable offenses, or that uh, he's somehow unfit, not because of some profound medical disability, but because you think character-wise or he's a norm buster or all the other things they say about Trump, you got to impeach him. That's not what the 25th Amendment is for. The 25th Amendment is for the very narrow, specific situation, which fortunately has not come up many times in our history, where the president is actually profoundly medically disabled. And the main situation that people often talk about is Woodrow Wilson had a stroke in 1919 and basically was never removed from power. His, you know, between his wife and his, uh, and his White House staff, they basically ran the government uh, until the end of his term. Uh, and then, you know, obviously you have situations like the, the, the killing of President Kennedy, mm-hmm. who, you know, theoretically – he could have lingered for a long time, and you would have had the situation of, you know, what do we do about the, the president not being able to function? So right. uh, that's what it's for, and they can't use it as a proxy for impeachment. Yeah, and it, and it doesn't seem that the president has any kind of disability at all whatsoever. I mean, he's already talking about uh, holding rallies uh, maybe even as soon as this weekend, and he's apparently talking about all of his testing, and he's been talking about that all day and tweeting about it all yesterday yep. evening. So that doesn't sound like somebody who's incapacitated to the point where they can't leave the country, Andy. No, and, and I think this goes to your point, Dana, because what, what anyone would say is <laughs> Pelosi didn't think this was a problem for four years. But now that we're on the verge of maybe <laughs> electing Biden, she's decided that we better do something about this because we could have – a non mentis president any day now. So I, I just, I don't see how this helps her. Yeah, no, I, nor do I, nor do I. And speaking of Biden as well, uh, he's, I love the, uh, the video mashups that just, that showcase all of the different ways that he's dodged the question about uh, court packing and Kam- uh, Kamala Harris as well during the vice presidential debate. She doing it as uh, she doing it too. And I'm amazed that no one, not even not even a lefty kind of reporter that is really interested in, in getting their name out there just on the on the on the back of being able to get the Democrat ticket to discuss this issue and getting them on record, yes or no. And, and none of the debate moderators have done that. Why is it so cagey for them? Why can't they just I mean, they're professionals. They, they, I mean, surely they are able to PR finesse some kind of answer that can at least satisfy everyone until, you know, we have the results of the election. But they're terrified to even do that. Why is that? Well, I think it's because they're on the same team and they understand what's going on here. Uh, Biden is not actually going to pack the court. They know that. Uh, there's at least a half a dozen, maybe up to 10 Senate, either Democratic senators or Democrats who are running for the Senate, who have all said that they're not up for court packing and they're not interested in what they call filibuster reform. Um, They're not looking, they're trying to present, you know, the image of being like mainstream, pragmatic, normal people, not, you know, (laughs) left-wing wackos. So everybody knows they're not going to pack the court. Uh, even Roosevelt, at the height of his power, which was much more powerful than any president we've had in recent history, mm. didn't dare do this and got slapped down by his party when he tried. Now, understandably, that was a different time, but still, it's a radical, radical idea. And packing the court would only be the beginning of the radicalism once they get rid of the filibuster. So I think what these guys understand is the reason Biden and Harris are doing this is precisely because they can't afford to send the hard left into orbit. They need Mm -hmm. those people to get elected. They need their energy. And look, the media wants to beat Trump just like uh, the Democrats do. They're kind of like one and the same. So they don't want to put Biden and and Harris on the spot and make them say, no, we're not going to pack the court because they know the AOCs and the Bernies and the rest of them will go 
uh, ballistic. So yeah, yeah. I think that's why. No, definitely. And that makes a lot of sense. Last quick thing for you. We're speaking with Andy McCarthy, uh, whose Ball of Collusion book, really, I mean, you wrote the book of the time, I have to tell you, Andy. The uh, the other big thing that immediately was just swept out of the, swept under the rug, swept out of the uh, the the attention, away from the attention span of the media was these declassified documents that were released by DNI National Intelligence Director John Ratcliffe that showed here you have John Brennan who was personally briefing Barack Obama and Joe Biden as it related to the Hillary Clinton approved or approval by Hillary Clinton plan to target the Trump campaign with all of these accusations regarding Russian collusion. And then Brennan hits back and says that it was selectively declassified, which I thought was kind of a weak defense. This to me, I mean, it just... I I'm I'm amazed at this whole story and I know you've you've obviously written so much about this what I mean what else it, what else are we going to get from this what other evidence does anyone need I mean at this point they're just short of all we would need I would think left to just further convict them at least in the minds of the voters is for them to just outright admit okay yeah we did it fine we did it yes we did we worked with a foreign entity someone who was classified as a threat to national security so that we could basically stage a bureaucratic coup against the American voter your your thoughts on this and and where does this go? Because I know you've said previously it's a, an abuse of power, but that does not necessarily mean that there's going to be some sort of criminal prosecution as an action. Yeah, well, I, I think, Dana, they're probably nine tenths of the way uh, to the place where you're uh, where you're suggesting where they have to admit it all. I mean, if you remember when these documents, when when. Uh, Ratcliffe first made his disclosure, what they said was, oh, uh, he's, he's being victimized by Russian disinformation. And mm-hmm. then he puts out the underlying documents, which show that, you know, no, everybody at the time uh, thought this was serious enough that President Obama had to be briefed on it and the CIA had to send information to the FBI about it. So now that it's clear that it, ha- it happened, and if you match it up with what was going on in the Clinton campaign at the convention in Philadelphia at the time, they clearly used the, the hacking of the DNC a, as a way to create a political narrative against Trump that he was in cahoots with Russia and he was responsible. So it, it's not like a, you don't need to be a Russian spy to know they did it. They did it, like right in front of our <laughs> eyes. Yeah. And, um, it, you know, no, it doesn't mean that they'll be able to uh, – to craft a crime out of it, but it's a, it's a profound major abuse of power. And what I expect will probably happen uh, since we're not going to get uh, charges or a report from the justice department before the election is they'll continue to use Lindsey Graham's committee and maybe Ron Johnson's committee, which are both investigating Russiagate to make, you know, whatever other relevant declassifications and disclosures of information there are. But I, but I agree with you. I don't think this is even, mysterious anymore yeah no it's a, n- not not at all mysterious and no longer able to be denied andy mccarthy always so good to talk with you my friend my goodness and you're going to be super busy next week as everything with the supreme court heats up and uh that gets back into the spotlight and that uh, hearing the nomination process gets underway so we appreciate your expertise on this as always my friend thank you thanks dana have a great weekend you too take care 